Good evening. It's a pleasure and an honor to be able to introduce tonight's distinguished speaker, Dr. John Holdren. I'd like to begin by highlighting briefly a few of Dr. Holdren, Holdren's many achievements and accolades. He uh, holds uh, undergraduate and graduate degrees from MIT and Stanford. He is currently the Teresa and John Hines Professor of Environmental Policy at the, Harv at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, among many other positions that he holds both at Harvard and at other institutions literally around the world. Dr. Holdren is a member of a who's who's list of societies, the US National Academy of Sciences, the US National Academy of Engineering, the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Academy of Political and Social Science, and the Council on Foreign Relations. In the 1990s, Dr. Holdren served two four-year terms on President Clinton's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. And from 2009 to 2017, Dr. Holdren was the White House Chief Science Officer, excuse me, the Science Advisor to President Obama, while, while, also, while also directing the Office of Science and Technology Policy. Especially relevant to tonight's seminar were his responsibilities involving oversight of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. To some, climate change is perhaps, perhaps somewhat akin to what Churchill described as a riddle wrapped in an enigma in search of the key. Nations and people's views on climate and climate change strategies are complex and wide-ranging. In the US, recent polls indicate that between 60 and 72 percent, depending on which poll you, you follow, believe uh, in human-induced climate change. On the other hand, only 5 percent of the US population rate climate change uh, uh, adaptation and mitigation as the top priority. And on the global f scene, a survey of 26 nations found that half of them believed that uh, climate change was their number one priority. So please join me this evening in welcoming Dr. Holdren to Steamboat and to seminars as he addresses the state causes and the challenges of climate change. What's known, what's expected, and what can be done, and what should be done. And perhaps he'll also explain why some call him Silver Shotgun Holdren. Dr. Holdren. Well, thank you very much, Walt, for that kind introduction. Thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, it's a great audience. And uh, I will try to get through this talk uh, with plenty of time left for questions and answers. Uh, some of it may seem a little bit like a drink from a fire hydrant. Uh, your consolation is that the slide deck uh, will be posted um, by the seminars in Steamboat. And so you'll be able uh, to take a closer look at things that maybe go by a little too quickly. All I have to do is figure out how this clicker works. There we go. So I'm going to start with what we know. I like this quote from Daniel Patrick Moynihan. Uh, there's another uh, quote I like from Neil deGrasse Tyson, who said, science is true whether or not you believe it. <laughs> I'm not doing very well with this clicker. There we go. All right. So let me start uh, with some real fundamentals. Uh, I hope this is not too faded out for you to see uh, in the audience. But the key point is that the surface temperature of the Earth, the temperature of the atmosphere near the surface where we live, is determined by a balance between incoming energy flows from the sun 
and heat radiated from the Earth's surface and from the atmosphere back into space. And the essential part of the balance for understanding how humans have started to influence global climate is the gold arrow, the large gold arrow on the right, where the Earth is radiating heat back towards space, but most of it is intercepted on the way by certain gases in the atmosphere that we call greenhouse gases, because uh, like the glass in a greenhouse, they're transparent to incoming sunlight, but they are largely opaque to the heat radiation that the Earth is trying to get rid of. And then that downward red arrow in the middle is heat radiation going back toward the surface of the Earth from those gases in the atmosphere that have intercepted it. And clearly, the quantity of greenhouse gases, the quantity of heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere is going to influence the energy balance and therefore influence the temperature of the surface of the Earth. Very important to understand, first of all, that there are some greenhouse gases in the atmosphere naturally, and some are added by human activities. There must be a particular place to point this to get it to. This clicker is not very effective. OK. So the most important naturally occurring greenhouse gases in the atmosphere are water vapor, just H2O in its gaseous form, and carbon dioxide. And interestingly enough, without those naturally occurring greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the surface of the Earth would be too cold to support life as we know it. When humans burn coal or oil or natural gas, or when they burn wood, the combustion products, which are almost entirely H2O and CO2, uh, go straight into the atmosphere. The fact is that much of the carbon dioxide remains in the atmosphere for decades, centuries, some of it for millennia. And because it remains there so long, the additions year to year accumulate. And so we have been building up the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the years. Much of it will still be there a 1,000 years from now. And so there is a large degree of irreversibility in the additions of this heat-trapping gas to the atmosphere. The water vapor, on the other hand, only stays in the atmosphere very briefly, so it does not accumulate and it does not add significantly. The direct emissions do not add significantly to the amount of heat-trapping water vapor in the atmosphere. But the fact that the Earth is warming as a result of the CO2 buildup leads to more evaporation all around the Earth, and that increases the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere. That's one of the things that climate scientists call a positive feedback. That is, a bit of warming leads to even more warming because of the water vapor that that warming adds to the atmosphere. If we look back uh, as far as 1850, which this diagram does, and look at the sources of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it turns out that the growth of population and prosperity combined over this period, this period from 1850 up until the present, led to an increase in civilization's total use of energy of more than 20-fold. And the great bulk of that increase came from burning fossil fuels, from burning coal and oil and natural gas. If you look at this thing carefully, you can see that the century from 1850 to 1950, the growth of human energy use was largely growth of coal combustion. And then from 1950 onwards, coal and natural gas expanded more rapidly. And the fact that astonishes many, for all that we hear about solar energy and wind and nuclear energy and hydropower, the fact is the United States as a country and the world as a whole still depend 80% on coal, oil, and natural gas for the energy they use. Even in the electricity sector, where hydro and nuclear and wind and solar make their contributions, their main contributions, two-thirds of the electricity in the world, generated in the world, and about two-thirds of the electricity generated in the United States come from burning fossil fuels with all of the carbon dioxide under current technology going straight into the atmosphere. So what we see in this history, 1850 uh, up to 2010, is that the growth of CO2 emissions occurred, of course, in proportion to the burning of fossil fuel, along with in proportion to land use change, particularly deforestation uh, 
for agriculture. Uh, the land use change is this sort of uh, brown band at the bottom, the effect of fossil fuels, the gray above, and you see the great bulk of the increase in carbon dioxide emissions came from the combustion of fossil fuels, but what came from land use change was by no means negligible. And that increase of carbon dioxide and some other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere associated with human activities, methane and nitrous oxide, uh, most importantly, which come themselves both from the energy sector and from agriculture, other heat trapping gases that come from industry, like chlorofluorocarbons, all of those together have changed Earth's energy balance by the means suggested in the very first slide. And climate scientists measure this in terms of what they call radiative forcing. The radiative forcing is just a measure of how hard the increased greenhouse gas concentrations are pushing on the climate. Forcing is a very nice term for that because it's literally how hard they're pushing on the, on the climate, how much they've changed the energy balance of the Earth. And those changes in the energy balance, that forcing, is what has warmed the Earth. This is a picture of annual global surface temperature averaged over the whole globe and over the whole year from 1880 on. The reason for choosing 1880 is around then was the first time that there were enough thermometer measurements over the land surface and over the oceans to meaningfully define a global average surface temperature. And what one sees in this is, among other things, that the five hottest years on record for the whole period since 1880, the five hottest years, all occurred since 2014. The last five years have been the hottest in the history of thermometer measurements of the average temperature of the Earth. Now, you see by the longer trend that there is a lot of variability. There's year-to-year -year variability, bounces up and down. There are a lot of natural influences on the average surface temperature of the Earth. But what one sees over this period is the human influence gradually becoming dominant until after 1970, it's completely dominant. There's still year-to-year -year variability, but the curve is going up very sharply. And the interesting thing is, that this is completely contrary to the direction the Earth would be going if only natural influences were at work. We understand those natural influences rather well. They occur on slow time scales, uh, cycles with periods of 20,000 years, 40,000 years, 100,000 years, associated with changes in Earth's orbit, changes in the tilt of the Earth, and so on. And they have been, those natural influences, have been cooling the Earth for most of the last 7,000 years, as you see in this diagram. Uh, we didn't have thermometers, obviously, for that whole period, but we can reconstruct estimates of the surface temperature of the Earth from analyzing gas bubbles trapped in layered ice cores in the Antarctic and Greenland, from looking at fossil corals, fossil sediments, fossil pollens, tree rings. And so we have pretty good reconstruction. The uncertainty band is the blue band. We have pretty good reconstruction of what temperature was doing. Up until about 7,000 years ago, we were coming out of the previous ice age. From 7,000 years ago on, we were heading for the next ice age. The good news is the human influence has averted the next ice age. We might have had one 10,000 years down the road, but we fixed that with the addition of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. The trouble is we overcompensated. And you can see at the far right this extraordinary spike uh, compared to the very long history dominated until the onset of the Industrial Revolution by cooling for the last 7,000 years. And then with the onset of the Industrial Revolution, that cooling started to level off, and then the temperature increase began. Come on. The temperature change has been non-uniform geographically. The Earth is not warming uniformly. The average is what I've been talking about. But now if you look, these are the figures uh, for the hottest year in the whole record, which was 2016. The average increase in the surface temperature over the whole globe for this period compared to a baseline of the average from 1951 to 1980 was 0.98 degrees Celsius. Uh, about 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, that's the 0.98 that's at the upper right. And you see color-coded 
the distribution of those changes over the surface of the Earth, and quite uh, dramatically, the biggest warming is taking place in the Arctic and in the West Antarctic ice sheet, where it's warming two to four times faster than the global average. You also see that the mid-continents on the whole are warming faster than the global average. And the unevenness of this temperature change is contributing to changes in the patterns of wind and ocean currents. Winds and ocean currents are driven by differences in the temperature increases. And you see uh, that we're not just talking about an average warming, we're talking about a change in patterns. And I'll say more about that in a minute. The changes are not just about temperature. Climate means the patterns of weather. Climate means the averages, the extremes, the timing, and the spatial distribution of, yeah, hot and cold, that's important, that's part of climate, but also cloudy and clear, humid and dry, drizzles, downpours, and hail, snowfall, snowpack, and snowmelt, breezes, blizzards, tornadoes, typhoons. And climate change entails disruption of the patterns, disruption of the patterns in all of these. The global average temperature is just an index of the state of the climate system, the very complex climate system. It's a little bit like the temperature of your body. When your body temperature goes up three or four degrees Fahrenheit, you're concerned not about the temperature per se. You're concerned because you know it's telling you that something is seriously amiss in the complex underlying system that is your body. And the same thing is true with the climate. Modest increases in that index, the global average surface temperature, are indicative of much more drastic changes in the whole system. In fact, I've suggested for 20 years now, without significant effect, that we should stop calling it global warming, which misleads people into thinking it's all the same everywhere and just about temperature. We should call it global climate disruption. Again, that proposition has sunk more or less without a ripple, but <laughs> it was worth, uh, worth trying, in my view. The changes matter. They matter because climate change governs, and therefore altering climate affects the availability of water across the planet, the productivity of farms and forests and fisheries, the prevalence of oppressive heat and humidity, how much heat and humidity we have to cope with uh, in our cities, in our countrysides, the formation and dispersion of air pollutants, the conventional air pollutants that directly impact human health is affected, are affected by climate change. The geography of disease, what pathogens and what vectors of disease can live in what abundance in what places. The damages from storms, floods, droughts, and wildfires, the property losses from sea level rise, the expenditures we have to make on engineered environments, how much of the environment do we have to air condition, how many dikes and dams do we have to build to control water flow, and so on. And finally, the distribution and abundance of species, all species governed by climate. The species we need, the species we love, and the species we hate, all influenced in their distribution and abundance by climate change. So let's look specifically at some of these manifestations of climate change. These are not projections. This is not modeling. These are observations, what we have seen up until now. This is the extent and thickness of Arctic sea ice, which uh, have both been shrinking, both the surface area covered by ice and the thickness of the ice. Top picture is 1984. The bottom picture is 2016. These are from the National Climate Assessment Report uh, in 2017, the first volume of the fourth assessment. Uh, and you see the drastic reduction in ice cover at the September minimum of Arctic ice cover. Uh, opening up new transportation routes, uh, that can be a benefit, but also having a variety of other effects. Sea ice is floating ice, so when it disappears, that doesn't affect sea level. It's just like ice melting in your drink. It doesn't change the level of the drink. But the change from ice to open water has big impacts. It affects regional temperatures because the underlying ocean absorbs much more energy than the ice did. The ice reflects most of the solar energy that hits it. And that means warming speeds up in the Arctic. That's one of the main reasons that the Arctic is warming faster than the whole globe, is we're melting the ice and snow, causing more solar energy to be absorbed there. Uh, it affects not only regional temperatures, but winds, 
affects storm damage, valued species, and it is even influencing weather in the mid-latitudes. By changing the temperature difference between the Arctic and the mid-latitudes, we are changing circulation patterns that are affecting the whole northern hemisphere. The Greenland ice sheet is rapidly losing ice. This is a graph of uh, monthly changes in the mass of the Greenland ice sheet in billions of tons. Loss of that land ice does contribute to sea level rise. It's not floating ice, it's ice that was on the land, and when it melts and goes in the ocean, sea level goes up. There's enough ice in Greenland alone that if it all melted and went in the ocean, sea level would go up by 23 feet. There is no scientific doubt about that. The only doubt about it is how rapidly human activities will continue to lead to disappearance of that ice, its addition to the ocean and the rise of sea level. There are many different analyses, but nobody has it exactly right. Uh, it might, if warming continued, take 1,000 years or 2,000 years for that 23 feet to materialize, but it would materialize ultimately. Mountain glaciers are shrinking worldwide. This is the same glacier photographed from the same vantage point, left 1917, right 2011. That shrinkage affects water availability in the drainages fed by the rivers that emerge from those glaciers, but it also contributes to sea level rise, the loss of the mountain glaciers, and they are disappearing all over the world. I could give a whole one hour talk just showing you before and after pictures of the world's mountain glaciers in the Himalayas, in the Andes, in the Rockies, uh, everywhere. Now here is a really key point, not widely enough understood. Weather extremes under climate change change much more rapidly than the mean. And the reason for this is a fundamental mathematical property of what we call normally distributed variables. The normal distribution is the bell curve, famously talked about in terms of IQ distribution, but also height distribution, but temperature distribution, wind distribution, storm distribution. And the most probable, the average, is changing just a little, and this diagram shows how when the average changes just a little, what happens out at the low probability extremes is drastic. We have so far increased the surface temperature of the Earth by about two degrees Fahrenheit, but we have increased the frequency of what used to be one in a hundred year heat waves and one in a thousand year heat waves by 20 to 100 times. Huge increases in the frequency of those extremes because we slid the whole distribution in the hot direction. And this is true of temperatures, it's true of rainfall, it's true of the power of tropical storms, it's true of every weather variable. The extremes are changing much more than the average. This gives you an example from temperatures. These are the highest temperatures ever recorded in all of these places, and they occurred in 2017 and 2018. Highest temperatures ever recorded. And you look at those numbers, Hong Kong, 102. Never got to 102 in Hong Kong before. Uh, South Africa, 122. Los Angeles, 111, and so on. Warming causes bigger torrential downpours. This is for an elementary reason. A warmer atmosphere can hold more water. This is just physics, no scientific doubt about it. And if the atmosphere can hold more water, more can come down at one time, and that, in fact, is happening. This is extreme one-day precipitation events in the lower 48 from 1910 to 2015. Again, you see there's a lot of year-to-year -year variability, but the trend is absolutely unmistakable. And we also have, because of changes in the atmospheric circulation, we have major storm systems tending to move more slowly, and so they dump more rain in one place. And that's been visible uh, all over the United States, indeed all over the world. These are two pictures from 2019, record flood flooding across the Midwest in the United States, Hamburg, Iowa, uh, in March of this year on the left, and just about a week and a half ago in Washington, D.C., we had three inches of rain in one hour, and streets flooded uh, around various parts, the low-lying parts of Washington, D.C. This is Canal Road in Washington, D.C. Uh, in uh, a little earlier this month, uh, people standing on the roofs of their cars. 
Droughts are worse under climate change. People sometimes wonder, how can you have droughts worse at the same time you have flooding worse? Well, a number of reasons. Higher temperatures mean bigger losses to evaporation between spells of precipitation. More of the rain falling in extreme events means more of it is lost to flood runoff and doesn't soak into the soil. So you get soil drying, a major contributor to drought. The mountains get more rain and less snow. That yields more runoff in winter, but less runoff for the summer and fall where the droughts, when the droughts occur. Earlier spring snow melt also happening leaves less runoff for summer. And altered circulation patterns also play a role. I'm going backwards here, okay. Uh, this is the US drought picture in 2018, just number of weeks in drought. Uh, and you see, again, a staggering amount of drought, uh, particularly across uh, the southwest uh, of the United States, but also in a number of other places. Uh, pests are flourishing in a warmer world, and I pick an example here, particularly germane to Colorado. Pine bark beetles have benefited from warming by a longer breeding season. They get four generations into a breeding season rather than the previous three. The trees are weakened by heat and drought already in California, in Colorado, in Alaska. And we've lost millions of acres of pine and spruce to the pine bark beetle, sometimes called the spruce bark beetle, uh, because of this combination of conditions all attributable to climate change. And here in Steamboat, you can see a lot of dead trees on the hills uh, that are the consequence of this impact. Wildfires are getting worse under climate change. Uh, this, I think, is one of the sleepers about climate change. I think few people 20 years ago gave a lot of thought to how climate change might increase the size, the intensity, and the frequency of wildfires. But as shown here, again, despite year-to-year -year variability, the upward trend is astonishing. We have more than four times the annual area burned in the United States by wildfires on the average than we had in the early 1980s. Uh, contributing factors are heat, drought, more dead trees killed by pests, and more lightning in a warming world. This was also not thought about 20 years ago. But in a warming world, the conditions favorable to thunderstorms and lightning uh, have increased, and we are seeing increases in lightning strikes, and lightning strikes are the biggest, biggest single cause of wildfires around the world. The U.S. fire season is now three months or more longer than it was 40 years ago. The average fire is much bigger and hotter than before, making them spread faster, more dangerous to property, more dangerous to firefighters. Nine of the 10 biggest U.S. wildfires in history took place since 2004, the other one in 1997. Little typo there, I'm sorry. In Alaska, even the tundra is burning. This is a picture of a tundra fire in 2015 in Antioch, Alaska. The tundra used to be too moist to burn, but it's burning now, and not just in the United States, in Canada, in Siberia, the tundra is burning. And smoke from, oops, went too fast again. Smoke from today's big wildfires harms health over huge areas. This is a diagram showing dangerous levels of smoke pollution propagating entirely across the United States from wildfires in the early fall of 2017 in the Northwest and causing acute air pollution in New England and a lot of places in between, as you see by that red band. Hurricanes and typhoons are getting stronger. They get their energy from the warm surface layer of the ocean, and the warm surface layer of the ocean is getting warmer. And so there's more energy there to be harvested by what climatologists, meteorologists call tropical cyclones. We call them hurricanes on the east coast and west coast of the United States, and we call them typhoons in the Indian Ocean and in the Western Pacific. But it turns out that the largest and most powerful tropical cyclones, hurricanes and typhoons, in virtually every ocean basin have taken place since 2012. This is not coincidence. They are getting more powerful, and they will continue to get more powerful. Direct connections to human health, something that people care about, everybody cares about, is health. And one of the reasons that interest in climate change in the United States has been rising relatively rapidly is the impacts on health have become more apparent. Heat-related illness and death, heat stroke increasing dramatically. Uh, 
severe weather impacts on health, injuries, fatalities, air pollution getting more severe in a warming world, allergy seasons getting longer and more intense in a warming world, vector ecology, mosquitoes, the example most familiar to everybody, uh, profiting in uh, a warmer world and moving the mosquitoes carrying malaria, the mosquitoes carrying Zika, moving northward, and so on. So let me turn very quickly to what we expect, uh, the future of climate change. Everything I've talked about so far is observations, things that we are watching happen, things that we are measuring. Again, these are not uh, climate models which are very useful but have some weaknesses. The observations have relatively few weaknesses. We know what we're seeing. But now let's look at the future, and I like this quote from Lao Tzu. Uh, if you don't change direction, you'll end up where you're heading. Uh, that is precisely uh, our problem. Uh, temperatures are going to continue to rise, no doubt about it. Nothing we can do can stop the rise of temperature in its tracks. But there is a huge difference between how much the temperatures go up if we take determined action to reduce emissions versus what the temperatures will do if we don't. And here on the left are the projected annual global carbon emissions under a number of different scenarios. The black part is the history, the observed history of emissions of uh, carbon in the form of carbon dioxide. And then the various curves on the right-hand side of the left-hand square are different scenarios. Business as usual, where we don't do much to reduce our emissions worldwide, is the top curve. The bottom curve, the green one, where we drastically reduce emissions soon, uh, is a curve where the world decides to take seriously the need to do something about climate change and uh, rapidly replaces CO2 emitting energy technologies with energy technologies that don't emit carbon dioxide. And then on the right, you see the temperatures that result from those different scenarios. And it's a drastic change. The temperature goes up either way, but it goes up only modestly uh, in the case where we drastically reduce emissions worldwide. These are emissions worldwide, not just for the United States. No one country can solve this problem. Uh, and under business as usual, the top curve, uh, global average surface temperature, uh, eight degrees Fahrenheit uh, higher uh, than the uh, pre-industrial value uh, compared to about two degrees Fahrenheit today. So a fourfold further increase in global average surface temperature and far, far bigger increases in the extremes. Without big emissions reductions, if we stay on one of those higher curves, what we can expect is large further increases in heat waves, a big further expansion in the area burned by wildfires, bigger torrential downpours even than the ones we've seen so far, and more flooding accompanying those, destruction of most of the world's coral reefs at an increase of only about 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. It's now estimated that we will lose 90% of the world's coral reefs. And by the way, the coral reefs are the second biggest reservoir of biodiversity on the planet. The biggest reservoir of biodiversity is the tropical forests. The tropical forests are also threatened by climate change. But the coral reefs, we're looking at the likelihood of 90% gone uh, as a result of just going to about 3.5 degrees Fahrenheit, 2 degrees Celsius. Wider disruption of marine food webs and fisheries. Part of the CO2 added to the atmosphere ends up being absorbed in the ocean. That produces weak carbonic acid, lowers the pH of the ocean, that is, increases its acidity. That is influencing all manner of ocean life that use calcium carbonate to make their shells or their skeletons. We are interfering at the base of ocean food chains with acidification and influencing the whole food chain with warming. Uh, that has the potential for very wide disruption of marine food webs. We'll see more category three to five hurricanes and typhoons making landfall. We'll see further increases in the frequency and intensity of droughts. We'll see falling agricultural yields for corn, for wheat, for rice, for soybeans. And another discovery in the last decade or so is that under increasing atmospheric carbon dioxide, the nutrient content of crops goes down. So we're not only going to be growing less, but it's going to be less nutritious.
as a result of what we've been adding to the atmosphere. And we expect those yields to decline, even accounting for continuing technological advances to increase agricultural productivity. It will not, those advances will not be able to completely offset the impacts of climate change, and particularly, again, the increases in the extremes. Some of the earlier studies you may have seen about being able to postpone losses in productivity under climate change were based on looking only at the average temperatures and average precipitation and not at the extremes. We'll see more sickness and death from heat stress and tropical diseases. It is already true today that in the hottest parts of the world, in the hottest months of the year, it is impossible, physically impossible, for people to work outdoors in agriculture, in fisheries, in construction, or they will die of heat stroke. And so we're seeing big drops in economic activity in those hottest countries in the hottest months, and that is going to spread to become a much more widespread phenomenon as we move further up the temperature curve. We will see worse thunderstorms, worse hailstorms, probably more and stronger tornadoes. The evidence is not as good as tor on tornadoes up until now, in part because the data on tornadoes uh, have not been as good. Tornadoes are very localized and temporary phenomena, and we've not always uh, had very good track of them. But the very strong suspicion is that tornadoes will also increase. And we'll see sea level rise that could reach as much as one meter, that's 3.3 feet, by 2050, and two meters, that's 6.6 .6 feet, by 2100. Those are at the upper end of the current range of estimates. Those are not the most likely estimates. But what's been happening is sea level rise has been accelerating, and it's been accelerating rapidly. And my own best judgment is we're going to see something close to the high end of sea level rise uh, as a result of the continuing acceleration of the loss of ice and the thermal expansion of the ocean. Part of the sea level rise is just a warmer ocean gets bigger because warm water is less dense than cold water. And so part of the contribution to sea level rise is simply thermal expansion. And as a result of all of this, we're going to see much bigger flows of environmental refugees around the world, people fleeing the areas of greatest damage, of greatest impact. And that will be associated with social and political tensions, maybe even with conflict. Now, it may be, if we're smart, if we're wise, if we're clever, that we can still, by taking early action, avoid some of the so-called tipping points that are worried about, where you very suddenly transition into a different climate or environmental state. Uh, one tipping point that a lot of us are worried about is that in the Arctic, the permafrost is thawing. The permafrost contains a tremendous amount of dead organic matter stored there for tens of thousands of years. And when the permafrost thaws, that dead organic matter becomes subject to bacterial decomposition. And the products of bacterial decomposition are CH4, methane, when the decomposition happens anaerobically, when there's water around, when it's happening in wet circumstances. Methane is about 30 times as effective per molecule at warming the Earth as CO2 is on a 100-year basis. When the decomposition is aerobic, you get CO2. We know that there is more carbon stored in the permafrost by a factor of about three than there is current carbon in the atmosphere. And so if we thaw that permafrost rapidly and that carbon all comes out, it's going to be a huge boost to the pace of global warming. And all climate-related impacts will grow very rapidly. Another tipping point is massive drying and fires in the, I say, formerly moist tropics. The Amazon is in danger under the high scenarios, the high emission scenarios, of drying out and no longer being a rainforest with very large additions of carbon dioxide as those trees die, decompose, and add carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and also huge damage to local peoples and biodiversity. Uh, another tipping point is we could see greatly accelerated sea level rise from rapid disintegration of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. Nobody has a good model of all the mechanisms that in the geologic past have sometimes caused deglaciations that have caused sea level to increase two to five meters in a single century. And the natural influences that were causing that are weaker 
than the influences, the forcings that we're now imposing on the climate. Uh, we could have a crash in ocean fisheries caused by a combination of warming, acidification, oxygen depletion, toxics, overfishing. This is a classic multiple stress problem. We could have a collapse of what's called the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation, shutting down the Gulf Stream. This is currently regarded as quite unlikely, but it's not impossible. It would have drastic effects on weather uh, in much of the northern hemisphere. And these tipping points are, in fact, possible even below a temperature increase of 2 degrees Celsius, but they become much more likely at a higher temperature increase. So what we can do, key question, what can we do about this? I'm looking at my watch here, see how we're doing. Uh, I'm going to move right along here. Uh, Jake Sullivan was the National Security Advisor to Vice President Biden in the Obama administration. Uh, and he wrote an article in Foreign Affairs with this lovely quote, between fatalism and complacency lies urgency. We can't afford complacency. We can't afford fatalism. We need urgency. We only have three options. Mitigation, meaning measures you take to reduce the pace and the ultimate magnitude of the changes in global climate that we're causing. Adaptation, the measures you take to reduce the adverse impacts on our well-being that result from the changes in climate that do occur. And the third option is suffering. Suffering the adverse impacts and the disruption of society that are not avoided by either mitigation or adaptation. The mitigation possibilities, reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and soot from the energy sector, reduce deforestation, increase reforestation and afforestation. Afforestation means growing trees where there weren't any before. Reforestation means growing trees where they used to be but aren't now. Modifying agricultural practices to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases and to build up soil carbon. Some of these measures will be costly, but they will be less costly by far than unmitigated climate change. They are worth doing. Conceivably, we will get desperate enough to do some even more efficient and trickier things. Uh, one is to learn to scrub greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere technologically. Trees do this naturally. And in the top set of options, we talk about growing more trees. But the estimates of how much of what is needed can be done by growing more trees and by changing agricultural practices generally run in the range of 15 to 30 percent of what is required. If you need more, maybe we could learn to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere technologically, but we know that's going to be very expensive. Uh, geoengineering, so-called, adjusting the reflectivity of the stratosphere by injecting particles up there, for example, to reflect more sunlight, to create cooling effects. It's limited in efficacy and has possible side effects, like eating up the ozone layer in the stratosphere and getting more cancer-causing ultraviolet radiation down here where we live. Adaptation, lots of possibilities. I'm not going to read this to you. I'll just run through them. You can read them yourself. Uh, they're pretty obvious, uh, things that we can do. One of the things we learned in, in Sandy, the huge storm that hit the New York area, is emergency generators in hospitals ought to be on the roof and not in the basement. The emergency generators were flooded out. Very elementary adaptation measure to reduce your vulnerability to flooding. Uh, building dikes and storm surge barriers against sea level rise, avoiding further development on floodplains and near sea level. And many of these measures would make sense even if there were not climate change increasing the storms and the fires and the floods. We've always had storms, we've always had fires, we've always had floods, and we've always been underprepared. We should be investing more money in preparedness even if climate were not changing. And by the way, I tried that argument with the Congress when I was in the Obama administration and pretty much got nowhere. Uh, they weren't very interested in that argument. They were cutting and trying to cut our investments in adaptation uh, because they said, well, we're against climate change and therefore we shouldn't invest in adaptation. Pretty crazy idea. So the fact is, we're already doing some of each of those things. We're already doing some mitigation. We're already doing some adaptation. And we're already doing some suffering, as I showed. And what's up for grabs is what the future mix is going to be. And if we want to minimize the suffering, which should be our goal, then we need to maximize both mitigation and adaptation. They're not substitutes. We need as much as we can get of both in order to minimize the human misery that results from the climate change that's ongoing and that's coming.
Mitigation alone won't work because climate change is already happening and we cannot stop it quickly. Adaptation alone won't work because adaptation gets more expensive and less effective as climate change grows, as the amount of climate change to which you're trying to adapt increases. Uh, if you live on a low-lying island, the adaptation response to sea level rise is evacuation, okay? Not very attractive. So what we need is enough mitigation to avoid unmanageable climate change and enough adaptation to manage the unavoidable climate change. How much mitigation do we need? The community of nations agreed in 2009 that we should try to hold the increase in global average surface temperature to 2 degrees Celsius, 3.6 above 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit above the pre-industrial level. The target was picked not because it would keep the world safe. Even at half that level, which we're now experiencing, we're not safe. We're already suffering in various ways. It was picked because it was the lowest figure that experts thought was achievable by measures that we could take, implement, and afford. But the adverse impacts already being experienced led the hardest hit countries to argue at the Paris Climate Conference in 2015 that two degrees would be devastating. That was a lot of folks from the low-lying island states who'd be evacuating at two degrees, and they argued that we should aim for one and a half. And the Climate Conference accepted that as an aspirational goal. We should try to hold the increase to one and a half. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was, was asked by the Climate Conference in Paris to do a study of what would the world look like at one and a half degrees C versus at two degrees C. If you like Fahrenheit, the lower number is 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit and we're already at two. The higher number is 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. And what they found was that sure enough, it would be much better to be at 1.5 than to be at two. Although 1.5 would be much worse than the one where we are now. But big incentive to hold it as low as we possibly can. But getting to that lower goal, to 1.5, would require very steep emissions reductions worldwide starting almost immediately. It's a very high bar. So, politics, the role of federal leadership. What did we do in the Obama administration? We did a bunch of things. I'm going to list them here again. In the interest of time, you can read faster than I can talk. So I'm just going to put them up here. And basically, it was actions that Obama took and interactions with China that we orchestrated that led to the success of the Paris Conference. It was Obama and Xi standing up in Beijing in November 2014 and saying, we're the two biggest economies, we're the two biggest emitters, we recognize the climate change challenge as a surpassing challenge for the 21st century, and both of our countries are prepared to lead. That changed the whole international debate. It brought India on board, Brazil on board, Indonesia on board, Mexico on board, and we got the Paris Agreement with 195 countries agreeing to reduce their emissions. And a big part of that bargain was the industrialized countries, the developed countries, pro providing assistance for both mitigation and adaptation to the poorer countries. Trump has, unfortunately, on this issue, opted out. Uh, here's what they did. They put climate change contrarians in charge at many of the key departments proposed deep cuts in climate science, clean energy R&D. Congress, fortunately, has not accepted uh, all of those proposed cuts, but they've accepted some of them, and it's done damage to the pace of innovation in addressing climate change. They canceled Obama's climate action plan, rescinded all of his executive orders on adaptation, announced withdrawal from the Paris Accord, and more importantly, since withdrawal cannot officially be done until November 2020. The most important thing is the Trump administration halted all actions in support of our Paris commitment, including cutting off all assistance on mitigation and adaptation to developing countries. And they loosened, of course, the regulation of fossil fuel exploitation. But the good news is that many states, cities, businesses, universities, and citizens are still in. The motto 
of the America's Pledge movement is we're still in. 500 cities, 20 states, 500 universities, 1,000 businesses, and many NGOs committed to do everything possible, in spite of the lack of federal support, do everything possible to meet the US commitments that we made in Paris. What do we actually need now to get to a two degree C target or better? We need a massive program of technological innovation and clean energy on clean energy and energy efficiency. That massive program should be carried out in partnerships, the government, industry, universities, and should include a variety of different focuses. Here's why I'm called silver shotgun holder. And I've said for years there's no silver bullet. There's no single silver bullet for addressing the climate change problem. We need a whole lot of bullets. And that's caused some of my colleagues to call me silver shotgun holder. <laughs> These are some of the bullets we need here as bullet points. Whoops. We need a similarly massive set of public-private industry university partnerships on adaptation to limit the harm from the changes in climate that we can no longer avoid. And we would get all that a lot faster if we could agree on a global carbon tax, starting soon at around $30 a ton of CO2, escalating to at least $100 a ton by 2030, preferably collected by national governments and rebated on a per capita basis, which takes away the regressive character of a tax on energy. That would encourage using the best available low and no emission technologies now, and it would encourage investing in research and development to get better ones. I think the political will to get all that done could materialize faster than many people think as a result of two trends. One, the unfortunate trend of rapidly increasing damages. That trend is increasing understanding of the challenge and the incentives to act. And the other trend is the declining cost of remedial action as a result of innovation. Solar energy has gotten incredibly cheaper over the last dozen years. Wind has gotten incredibly cheaper over the last dozen years. And even the advanced technologies needed to capture carbon dioxide from the smokestacks of fossil fuel burning power plants and sequester that carbon dioxide deep in the earth away from any possibility of being added to the atmosphere, even that, under innovation, has been getting cheaper. And that's made ever clearer that action is going to be cheaper than inaction. So what everybody should do, here's what I think we all should do. And again, I'll just show you the list. Increase your understanding, share your insights, reduce the carbon footprint of your home and your transportation habits, encourage the climate change mitigation and adaptation activities undertaken by your state and local governments, support businesses and civil society organizations that are taking constructive action, and last but certainly not least, vote and even better work for political candidates who understand the climate challenge and pledge to act. As Rene Dubose said many years ago, trend is not destiny. We can change this. Uh, this is just for your perusal later. If you want to see uh, more detail about this, the sources of the scientific uh, understandings that I put before you, uh, these are places on the web where you can find those ideas. And now we go to Q&A. Walt, you want to come up? So you can have the mic because I've got this. Thanks. Uh, thank you, John. It's great. So I, I'd like to open with a two-part question. Uh, why, uh, with everything that uh, has, well, let me start with this question. With all the facts that, that you've presented, uh, with all of the outlooks, of the negative outlooks that you've presented. Why do you think there is such resistance to taking uh, positive action on mitigating climate change? I, I think there are a number of reasons. One, uh, climate change got politicized in the 90s. And it got politicized in the 90s when 
Al Gore was the Vice President of the United States, and he was sort of Mr. Climate Change, and it became apparent to the other political party that Al Gore was going to be the candidate in 2000. And if Mr. Climate Change was going to be the candidate, uh, a lot of Republicans decided that they would be critics of climate change as part of being critical of the Democratic candidate. Second thing that happened was uh, a lot of people, not just Republicans, worried about government overreach and excessive regulation. And there was actually a uh, very well-known Republican strategist named Frank Luntz, who in 2000 wrote a memo to the Republican leadership saying, Republican leaders need to criticize climate science because if the public ever accepts what climate scientists are saying, then the public will embrace a regulatory regime which will be the ultimate in government overreach, in government intervention in the private sector. And we Republicans would hate that, so we have to fight it at its source by calling the science into question. Luntz, a year and a half ago, apologized for having written that memo. But the memo was very influential. It leaked. That's how I know what it says. Uh, and the view persists that the only way to address climate change is going to end up involving draconian government regulation. I think that's not correct. There are a whole series of ways to go after climate change that use the assets of the private sector. Many of them are going to make money. Climate change is a big economic opportunity. The world is going to spend $30 trillion over the next 20 years or so on clean energy technologies and energy efficiency technology. $30 trillion. And the question that many of us have been raising is do we want United States companies to have a share of that $30 trillion business or do we want to buy those technologies from the Chinese and the Japanese and the Germans and the South Koreans? Uh, I think there's a huge economic opportunity there. It's reflected in the fact that ahead of Trump's decision to withdraw from the Paris Accord, 600 American CEOs signed a letter to Trump saying, please stay in. It will be bad for business if the United States leaves the Paris Agreement. And he left anyway. I think he left because Obama had done it. And whatever Obama had done, uh, Mr. Trump seemed to want to rescind. But uh, I believe that just on economic grounds, it makes sense to tackle climate change and to tackle it creatively, to tackle it in partnership between the government and the private sector. One of the reasons that I support a carbon tax, as I talked about here, is that is the approach favored by economists across the whole political spectrum. Republican economists, independent economists, democratic economists, they all say the single most important thing we could do to advance addressing the climate change challenge is to impose a carbon tax. There's a wild card in, in these uh, climate change projections and mitigation strategies, and that is uh, population and population growth. Uh, how do you see that being factored into what we can and what we cannot do? In 2007, I was one of the authors of a report for the Secretary General of the United Nations called Climate Change and Development. There were 18 authors from 11 countries, including China and India, Japan, Australia, Germany, um, United States, Canada. And in that report, we calculated the effects of different population futures on greenhouse gas emissions. We looked at the population factor. We looked at the affluence factor, material consumption per person. And we looked at the technology factor, how much can technologies change. And of course, as Paul Ehrlich and I pointed out in 1970, population, consumption per person, and emissions per unit of consumption all multiply each other to give you the total emissions, to give you the total impact. And that means all three of those factors are important. Anything you can do to improve, to reduce any one of those factors will reduce emissions. And we showed, very obviously, 
that in 2050, if the population of the world was 8 billion rather than 10 billion, uh, it would be easier. Our emissions would be lower. The demands we made on technology could be smaller. In 2100, if the population were 9 billion instead of 12 or 15 billion, it would be easier to deal with these problems. So how do you make the population lower? The thing that we have learned over the last 50 years about reducing population growth rates is the single most effective measure is increasing opportunities, education, and health care for women. Single most important thing. And we ought to be doing that, both because it makes sense for its own sake, increasing education opportunities and health care for women, but also because it will make the population dimension of our impact on the environment less intractable. So. In, in the realm of, of air pollution control, cap and trade has been an effective measure. Do you see that having a role, a significant role, in climate mitigation? Yeah, here's the interesting thing about cap and trade. A carbon tax and cap and trade are actually very similar. In the case of a carbon tax, the government sets the price and the market determines the quantity. In the case of cap and trade, the government sets the quantity and the market determines the price. But in each case, you can adjust going forward to get the result that you need. The difference is that a tax is much easier to administer. The tax uh, is easier to, to define, easier to collect, and so most economists come down in favor of a carbon tax over cap and trade, but most of them, and again, this is nonpartisan, this is true across the spectrum of economists, they'll tell you that cap and trade is second best, and if we can't get first best, if for political reasons we can't get anything with the name tax associated with it, then we should embrace cap and trade. I used to say in the councils of the White House, we shouldn't call it a tax, we should call it a green fee, and then all the golfers would support it. <laughs> this next question is one that you partially alluded to in your presentation. Can we do anything to change the climate without the full participation of China and India? Short answer is no. Uh, we need China and India. China is now the world's biggest emitter of carbon dioxide, much bigger. They're now 50% bigger than the United States. Uh, China passed us in total emissions in 2007. They are still much smaller in per capita emissions than the United States, because they have so many capitas, they have so many people. <laughs> but they are the biggest emitter. India is the third biggest emitter and likely to pass the United States and China over the next 20 years. Uh, they are so big that the problem cannot be solved without them. But we don't have to solve it without them. China, for all of the indignities that they commit and that we hate, has the right attitude about climate change. President Xi understands climate change. All of his ministers understand climate change. There is no skepticism in the Chinese government about the damage that climate change is already doing in China. They also understand that the conventional air pollution, the soot, the particulate matter, the oxides of sulfur that are killing a million people a year in China. Air pollution kills a million people a year in China. And the measures you need to stop that are for the most part the same measures you need to reduce your carbon dioxide emissions. So the Chinese see reducing carbon dioxide emissions as a win-win. You're going to get big direct health benefits, but you're also going to make crucial contributions to the world's efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the Chinese have already understood in the late 1990s that climate change was doing damage to China. They weren't saying so publicly in the 1990s. But I've been going to China since 1984 and meeting with Chinese leaders since 1984. I met with Deng in 1984. I've met with Xi. I've met with all of the Chinese leaders in between. And in private conversation, the Chinese leaders were saying to me in the late 1990s, climate change has affected the East Asian monsoon. It's weakened it. 
in ways that have aggravated flooding in the south of China and drought in the north, big impacts on Chinese agricultural production, and their own climate scientists in the late 1990s and early 2000s were attributing that phenomenon to global climate change. They got it. And they, of course, more recently, have changed their rhetoric to make it clear that they get it. And even with the United States having withdrawn from the Paris Agreement, China says, we're not withdrawing. We're going we're to surpass the commitments that we made in Paris. India came along somewhat reluctantly. They've been behind the Chinese in understanding the problem. But today, they understand it. After the Obama Xi statement in Beijing in November 2014, about a week later, I was in India meeting with the foreign minister, the environment minister, the power minister, the coal minister. Not a single one of them denied the reality of climate change. What they wanted to talk about is in light of the US-China announcement, the announcement by Presidents Obama and Xi, what do you think we're going to have to do to remain good citizens in the global community? And the reason India came on board in Paris was what Obama and Xi had done a year before. And they too, the Indian climate science community has exactly the same view as the US climate science community and the Chinese climate science community. I've been going to India since 1987 and meeting with their leaders and their climate scientists, and they get it. So this old saw that there's no use the United States doing anything because China and India are never going to do anything is just wrong. China is the biggest builder of renewable energy technology in the world today. They're deploying more renewable energy technology than anybody else. And India is starting to switch from building coal power plants to building wind and solar power plants. The Indian power minister said to me three months ago that we're not going to build any more coal power plants in India after the early 2020s because our predictions are that solar and wind with battery backup are going to be cheaper than coal in India after 2025. Uh, so, I believe we're getting close to the end. So I want to ask a question that, that deals what we uh, as individuals can right. be doing. And so this question comes up. Uh, my family has given up eating beef. Uh, due to its effect on the environment. Uh, what are the if impacts of, of, uh, on CO2 emissions, not only from beef, uh, let's say from lamb, from pigs, and, and chicken? Well, for, for, first of all, there are significant greenhouse gas emission implications of our diets. And uh, beef is, has a particularly big carbon footprint uh, because of uh, the uh, amount of feed uh, and water that has to be provided to produce a pound of beef, which is considerably larger than what it takes to produce a pound of pork. And what it takes to produce a pound of pork is considerably more than it takes to produce a pound of chicken. So if you want to reduce your personal carbon footprint, uh, eat more chicken and less beef. Uh, I, I have to admit that I still eat both. Uh, uh, I like beef a lot. And uh, there are other things I'd rather sacrifice than the opportunity to eat uh, a great piece of beef from time to time. But my wife and I have cut back on our, on our beef consumption. And we eat uh, more pork than we used to, and more chicken than we used to, and more fish than we used to. Uh, again, fish uh, are terrific to eat, as long as you're not eating uh, too many big tuna full of mercury. Uh, and as long as the ocean fisheries and uh, sustainable aquaculture uh, continue to flourish. Uh, but ultimately, uh, we may all find ourselves in the long term eating a more plant-based diet. And they're very interesting developments, as most of you know. Uh, the Impossible Burger, uh, the uh, other approaches to uh, making uh, something that tastes like beef and looks like beef but was made with plant material uh, rather than with beef. Um, we'll see what happens there. But there are many other things that we can do that are also important. Uh, changing your transportation habits. Now, one of the things that was discovered when we took an inventory of the habits of Harvard professors is that half of our carbon footprint is jet travel. Half of it. Uh, and so 
uh, we need to do what we can to cut back on our jet travel. You know, we all rationalize it. I say, well, I get on this jet plane to China because I'm trying to get the countries to work together to solve the climate change challenge, and so my carbon footprint is maybe not so important. But that's a rationalization. There are some meetings that really are important enough to fly to, but there are others that one could replace with a video conference. And in fact, I gave the keynote speech at a big meeting in China to which I was invited by video conference not long ago, rather than flying there. Uh, that can make a big difference. Uh, our automobiles can make a big difference. Uh, uh, my wife and I drive a Prius, uh, but we are uh, thinking about uh, going all the way to a pure electric. Uh, huge difference in, in impact. Uh, but then again, there's also uh, why drive your two-ton SUV to the supermarket to buy a carton of eggs? Uh, you know, we can, we can do a more sensible job of matching our vehicles to the needs at the time. John, thank you so much. It's been very enlightening. <laughs>